Chapter 6 The Soul and the Nature of Its Perception With the little background given so far, we can at least begin to discuss the subject of this book, the eternal validity of the soul. Even when we are exploring other issues, we will be trying to illustrate the multidimensional aspect of this inner self. There are many misconceptions connected with it, and first of all, we shall try to dismiss these. First of all, a soul is not something that you have, it is what you are. I usually use the term entity in preference to the term soul, simply because those particular misconceptions are not so connected with the word entity and its connotations are less religious in an organizational sense. The trouble is that you frequently consider the soul or entity as a finished, static, quote-unquote thing that belongs to you but is not you. The soul or entity, in other words, your most intimate, powerful inner identity, is and must be forever changing. It is not, therefore, something like a cherished heirloom. It is alive, responsive, curious. It forms the flesh and the world that you know, and it is in a state of becoming. Now, in the three-dimensional reality in which your ego has its main focus, becoming presupposes a rival or a destination, an ending to that which has been in a state of becoming. But the soul or entity has its existence basically in other dimensions, and in these, fulfillment is not dependent upon arrivals at any points, spiritual or otherwise. The soul or entity is always in a state of flux, or learning, and of developments that have to do with subjective experience rather than with time or space. This is not nearly as mysterious as it might sound. Each of my readers plays a game in which the egotistical conscious self pretends not to know what the whole self definitely does know. Since the ego is definitely a part of the whole self, then it must necessarily be basically aware of such knowledge. In its intense focus in physical reality, however, it pretends not to know until it feels able to utilize the information in physical terms. You do have access to the inner self, therefore. You are hardly cut off from your own soul or entity. The ego prefers to consider itself the captain at the helm, so to speak, since it is the ego who most directly deals with sometimes tumultuous seas of physical reality, and it does not want to be distracted from this task. Channels, psychological and psychic, always exist, sending communications back and forth through the various levels of the self, and the ego accepts necessary information and data from inner portions of the personality without question. Its position, in fact, depends in a large manner upon this unquestioning acceptance of inner data. The ego, in other words, the exterior self that you think of as yourself, that portion of you maintains its safety and its seeming command precisely because inner layers of your own personality constantly uphold it, keep the physical body operating, and maintain communications with the multitudinous stimuli that come both from outside conditions and inside conditions. The soul or entity is not diminished, but expanded through reincarnations, through existence and experience in probable realities, something I will explain later. It is only because you have a highly limited conception of your own entity that you insist upon its being almost sterile in its singularity. There are millions of cells within your body, but you call your body a unit and consider it your own. You do form it from the inside out, and yet you form it from living substance, and each smallest particle has its own living consciousness. There are clumps of matter, and in that respect there are clumps of consciousness, each individual with their own destiny and abilities and potentials. There are no limitations to your own entity, therefore. How can your entity or soul have boundaries, for boundaries would enclose it and deny it freedom? Often it seems that the soul is thought of as a precious stone to be finally presented as a gift to God, or considered as some women used to consider their virginity, something highly prized that must be lost, the losing of it being signified as a fine gift to the receiver. In many philosophies, this sort of idea is retained, the soul being returned to a primal giver, or being dissolved in a nebulous state somewhere between being and non-being. The soul is, however, first of all, creative. It can be discussed from many viewpoints. Its characteristics can be given to some degree, and indeed most of my readers could find out these characteristics for themselves if they were highly enough motivated, and if this was their main concern. The soul or entity is itself the most highly motivated, most highly energized, and most potent consciousness unit known in any universe. It is energy concentrated to a degree quite unbelievable to you. It contains potentials unlimited, but it must work out its own identity and form its own worlds. 
It carries within it the burden of all being. Within it are personality potentials beyond your comprehension. Remember, this is your own soul or entity I am speaking of, as well as soul or entity in general. You are one manifestation of your own soul. How many of you would want to limit your reality or entire reality to the experience you know now? You do this when you imagine that your present self is your entire personality or insist that your identity be maintained unchanged through an endless eternity. Such an eternity would be dead indeed. In many ways, the soul is an incipient god, and later in this book we will discuss the quote-unquote god concept. For now, however, we will simply be concerned with the entity or soul, the larger self that whispers even now in the hidden recesses of each reader's experience. I hope in this book not only to assure you of the eternal validity of your soul or entity, but to help you sense its vital reality within yourself. First of all, however, you must have some idea of your own psychological and psychic structure. When you understand to some extent who and what you are, then I can explain more clearly who and what I am. I hope to acquaint you with those deeply creative aspects of your own being so that you can use these to extend and expand your entire experience. Many individuals imagine the soul to be an immortalized ego, forgetting that the ego as you know it is only a small portion of the self. So this section of the personality is simply projected onward ad infinitum, so to speak. Because the dimensions of your reality are so little understood, your concepts are bound to be limited. In considering quote-unquote immortality, mankind seems to hope for further egotistical development, and yet he objects to the idea that such a development might involve change. He says through his religions that he has a soul indeed, without even asking what a soul is, and often he seems to regard it again as an object in his possession. Now personality, even as you know it, constantly changes, and not always in ways that are anticipated, most often, in fact, in unpredictable ways. You insist upon focusing your attention upon the similarities that are woven through your own behavior, and upon these you build a theory that the self follows a pattern that you, instead, have transposed upon it. And the transposed pattern prevents you from seeing the self as it really is. Therefore, you also project this distorted viewpoint upon your conception of the reality of the soul. You think of the soul, therefore, in the light of erroneous conceptions that you hold regarding even the nature of your mortal selves. Even the mortal self, you see, is far more miraculous and wondrous than you perceive, and possesses far more abilities than you ascribe to it. You do not understand as yet the true nature of perception, even as far as the mortal self is concerned, and therefore you can hardly understand the perceptions of the soul. For the soul, above all, perceives and creates. Remember again that you are a soul now. The soul within you, therefore, is now perceiving. Its methods of perception are the same now as they were before your physical birth, and as they will be after your physical death. So basically, the inner portion of you, the soul stuff, will not suddenly change its methods of perception nor its characteristics after physical death. You can find out what the soul is now, therefore. It is not something waiting for you at your death, nor is it something you must save or redeem, and it is also something that you cannot lose. The term, to lose or save your soul, has been grossly misinterpreted and distorted, for it is the part of you that is indeed indestructible. We will go into this particular matter in a portion of the book dealing with religion and the God concept. Your own personality, as you know it, that portion of you that you consider most precious, most uniquely you, will also never be destroyed or lost. It is a portion of the soul. It will not be gobbled by the soul, nor erased by it, nor subjugated by it, nor, on the other hand, can it ever be separated. It is, nevertheless, only one aspect of your soul. Your individuality, in whatever way you want to think of it, continues to exist in your terms. It continues to grow and develop, but its growth and development is highly dependent upon its realization that while it is distinct and individual, it is also but one manifestation of the soul. To the extent that it realizes this, it learns to unfold in creativity and use those abilities that lie inherent within it. Now, unfortunately, it would be much easier simply to tell you that your individuality continues to exist and let it go at that. While this would make a fairly reasonable parable, it has been told in that particular way before, and there are dangers in the very simplicity of the tale. The truth is that the personality you are now, and the personality that you have been and will be, in the terms in which you understand time, all of these personalities are manifestations of the soul, of your soul. Your soul, therefore, the soul that you are, 
the soul that you are a part of, that soul is far more creative and miraculous phenomenon than you previously supposed. And when this is not clearly understood, and when the concept is watered down for simplicity's sake, as mentioned earlier, then the intense vitality of the soul can never be understood. Your soul, therefore, possesses the wisdom, information, and knowledge that is part of the experience of all these other personalities, and you have within yourself access to this information, but only if you realize the true nature of your reality. Let me emphasize again that these personalities exist independently within and are a part of the soul, and each of them are free to create and develop. There is, however, an inner communication, and the knowledge of one is available to any, not after physical death, but now in the present moment. Now the soul itself, as mentioned earlier, is not static. It grows and develops, even through the experience of those personalities that compose it, and it is, to put it as simply as possible, more than the sum of its parts. Now, there are no closed systems in reality. In your physical system, the nature of your perceptions limits your idea of reality to some extent, because you purposely decide to focus within a given quote-unquote locale. But basically speaking, consciousness can never be a closed system, and all barriers of such a nature are illusion. Therefore, the soul itself is not a closed system. When you consider the soul, however, you usually think of it in such a light, unchanging, a psychic or spiritual citadel. But citadels not only keep out invaders, they also prevent expansion and development. There are many matters here very difficult to express in words, for you are so afraid for your sense of identity that you resist the idea that the soul, for example, is an open spiritual system, a powerhouse of creativity that shoots out in all directions. And yet this is indeed the case. I tell you this and at the same time remind you that your present personality is never lost. Now, another word for the soul is entity. You see, it is not a simple matter of giving you a definition of a soul or entity, for even to have a glimpse in logical terms, you would have to understand it in spiritual, psychic, and electromagnetic terms, and understand the basic nature of consciousness in action as well. But you can intuitively discover the nature of the soul or entity, and in many ways, intuitive knowledge is superior to any other kind. One prerequisite for such an intuitive understanding of the soul is the desire to achieve it. If the desire is strong enough, then you will be automatically led to experiences that will result in vivid, unmistakable, subjective knowledge. There are methods that will enable you to do this, and I will give you some of them toward the end of this book. For now, here is one quite effective but simple exercise. Close your eyes after having read this chapter to this point, and try to sense within yourself the source of power from which your own breathing and life force come. Some of you will do this successfully at your first try. Others may take longer. When you feel within yourself this source, then try to sense this power flow outward through your entire physical being, through the fingertips and toes, through the pores of your body, all directions, and with yourself as center. Imagine the rays undiminished, reaching then through the foliage and clouds above, through the center of the earth below, extending even to the farthest reaches of the universe. Now, I do not mean this to be merely a symbolic exercise, for though it may begin with imagination, it is based upon fact, and emanations from your consciousness and the creativity of your soul do indeed reach outward in that manner. The exercise will give you some idea of the true nature, creativity, and vitality of the soul from which you can draw your own energy, and of which you are an individual and unique portion. Now, this discussion is not meant to be an esoteric presentation with little practical meaning in your lives. The fact is that while you hold limited concepts of your own reality, then you cannot practically take advantage of many abilities that are your own. And while you have a limited concept of the soul, and to some extent, you cut yourself off from the source of your own being and creativity.